Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to the first of two Congo Mission Network programs in the month of March. Today, we will look at community development. Next Saturday, we encourage you to join us for a focus on women and children. I am Colleen Shannon, an elder at First Presbyterian Church in Knoxville and a member of the Congo Mission Network Planning Committee. A year ago, when we began planning for the annual gathering of the Congo Mission Network, the world was in the first stages of the pandemic that would go on to decimate populations and result in incredible suffering. In the United States, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others were evidence of the heinous history of racism that still permeates this nation. In response to both of these realities, the Congo Mission Network Committee launched a six month series of virtual events based on the confession of Belhar. The previous sessions are still available on YouTube. From the devotional Belhar Confession Booklet, published by the Presbyterian Peacemaking Committee, I have taken our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and all merciful creator, we know that confession is a two-edged sword in which we know that the attitudes and conduct which work against the gospel are present in all of us. Guide us, beloved Jesus, even if we must suffer for you in repairing evil by doing the good work of unity, reconciliation, and justice in your name. Amen. Today, we welcome Hunter Farrell, former director of Presbyterian World Mission, to set the stage for our program as he lifts up the two hands of mission. Hunter and his wife, Ruth, former coordinator of the Presbyterian Hunger Program, hold the people of Congo close in their hearts from the years they spent living and working alongside them. Following Hunter, Valerie Nodem of the Presbyterian Hunger Program will introduce us to Joining Hands Congo and the communities that are successfully challenging the industries of mineral extraction in order to bring benefit, not harm, to the Congolese people. Looking to the US, Alonzo Johnson, coordinator of self-development of people, will trace the history of structural racism that has systematically deprived black farmers of access to land and resources. Alonzo will share a snapshot of how communities working together can begin to redress these wrongs. As you listen to these presentations, you may place your questions in chat for our speakers to address following the program. My name is Hunter Farrell, um, and I had the privilege of working with uh, my wife, Ruth, and our kids uh, in Ndesha and Kananga, beginning in 1981 um, and finishing in 1990, um, just a few years ago. So uh, it, those were seminal years, transformative years, and changed the, not only the trajectory of our lives, but also our understanding of how God works in the world. Um, the organizers of the Mission Network uh, gathering have asked me to uh, share something that I wrote for the Presbyterian Mission Agency um, back in December uh, of last year. And it's a, an essay called Mission with Both Hands. And so I'd like to read that to you now. While doing mission, justice is every bit as important as mercy. Has the church merely to gather up those whom the wheel has crushed, or has she to prevent the wheel from crushing them? Said Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Ethics. Beginning in 1984, 
the world was confronted with horrendous televised images of starving children and their weeping mothers, victims of the now infamous Ethiopian famine that eventually claimed more than one million lives. Christian churches responded generously, including Ethiopian famine relief as a mission priority in many churches. Together with a wide array of government and nonprofit organizations, the international community quickly generated more than $100 million for direct food aid. But as media attention moved elsewhere, some troubling facts began to emerge. Although the humanitarian crisis had been framed as a famine, throughout the 1980s, there was actually more than enough food produced in Ethiopia to feed its entire population. But in the national context of the rebellion of the Tigray, Eritrea, and Wolo regions against the brutal Derg regime in Addis Ababa, the root problem was one of food distribution. The government, after engineering widespread starvation to punish the rebels, adeptly diverted the, the, the donated food aid from the needy to feed its own army. The end result was chilling. The humanitarian effort prolonged the war and with it human suffering, concluded renowned British researcher Alex DeWall after his exhaustive study of the international response to the famine. Because sincere Christian mission efforts had ignored the underlying structural issues, well-intended help was misdirected and tens of thousands more Ethiopians died. Mission without justice ceased to be God's mission at all. God's mission clearly includes charity. A cup of cold water given in Jesus' name, the Samaritan's extraordinary care for the victim of highway robbery, the traditional alms for the poor that has characterized the institutional church throughout the millennia. Charity is clearly biblical, and it's a hallmark of Christian faithfulness. After 35 years of working with Presbyterian congregations engaged in local and global mission, I found that the overwhelming majority of our congregations dedicate nearly 100% of their mission attention and budget to charity work. But as the story from the Ethiopian famine reminds us, a single-minded focus on charity can blind us to the larger issues behind the suffering that we seek to alleviate. A Congolese proverb says, it takes two hands to wash. God's mission consists of both charity to stop our, na our neighbor's bleeding and justice to prevent the wound in the first place. This fact has caused me to reflect some on the reasons behind this curiously singular focus in our congregations. I know for myself, if I'm honest, charity work is highly satisfying. I'm almost always thanked for my service. When I offer a hot meal to a homeless family at the city shelter, I often stand behind the counter. My position as benefactor shields me from the uncertainties and insecurity of a deeper relationship with a person forced to live on the streets in conditions that I wouldn't tolerate for my own family. The thought of that relationship frightens me a bit, to be honest. Charity can even anesthetize me into thinking I've done my part when in fact my neighbor is still being exploited in ways that benefit me when my insistence on lower taxes results in my neighbor not having access to desperately needed mental health services. If that unbelievable price I paid for my new shirt was only possible because of the unjust wages and dangerous working conditions of my global neighbor, I'm profiting from my neighbor's suffering. If my stock portfolio includes investments in companies that abuse their workers to extract greater profit and enhance dividends, I'm a direct beneficiary of injustice and am literally funding the wheel that is crushing my neighbor's life. And so I'm tempted to turn a blind eye, claiming it's just too complicated. So mere charity, mere charity can divert our attention from the other hand of mission, the struggle for justice to prevent the suffering before it begins to crush the life of our neighbors. Confronted by the complexities of global poverty, maybe I feel better about myself and my own relative wealth when I gaze upon the smiling picture of the sponsored child on my refrigerator or share on my Facebook page the story of my 
church's clothes closet for the poor. Now, I know for a fact that unjust structures condemn the poor to inadequate housing, education, health care, and jobs. You and I know that. But I'm certain that to work with the oppressed in identifying and addressing the root causes of their plight would require something more costly to me. It would require me to heed Dietrich Bonhoeffer's call to stop ignoring the wheel that is crushing so many people. It would require a commitment to justice to prevent their suffering rather than merely tending to their wounds. Because changing the unlost law, unjust laws and structures that keep the poor down would require a long-term relationship of accompaniment with the poor. And I'm certain that relationship would be very costly to me because it would change me. It would change the products that I buy, how I invest my money, how I vote. It would force me to choose between the worship of mammon, my investment income, and Jesus, who overturned the money changers' tables in his anger with injustice. So I have to wonder, has the American church's almost singular focus on charity, as opposed to justice, become an idol that keeps us feeling good about ourselves, but ignorant of the causes of our neighbor's suffering? Can I fully love my neighbor unless I'm willing to keep the wheel from crushing them? I think these questions were in my mind 20 years ago when the Presbyterian Hunger Program's former international coordinator, Lionel de Renancourt, first explained to me a new model of mission, the Joining Hands Against Hunger initiative, now led ably by Valérie Nodem. The effort wisely saw that the American church was using only one hand of mission, charity, and invited our church into the slow, hard work of solidarity for justice, to create spaces where mission partners from the churches and civil societies of the global south could share their analysis of the, roots of the root causes of injustice with partners from the global north and work together to overcome them. Because mission and solidarity is woven through innumerable human relationships, tangible fruits of the joining hands model have taken some time to be seen. But laws in Egypt had been changed in favor of children with special needs. A highly polluting US-owned metal smelter in Peru with a legacy of thousands of lead poisoned children was forced to decrease its toxic emissions. And Cameroonian families displaced by the Exxon pipeline have found the encouragement to organize and advocate. These are the results of the global solidarity woven together by the Joining Hands initiative. So take a look at your own congregation's mission work. What portion of your time, your budget, your prayer, your attention is dedicated to the important work of charity? Good. And now, how much to justice? That preventive work of identifying and addressing the root causes of our neighbor's suffering. Could it be that our need for the instant gratification that charity work often generates has become an idol that keeps us from joining God and neighbor in the deeper work of justice? Maybe it's time to use both hands in justice. Va, sigue contaminando, quemando, quemando. O sea, que esto ya no tiene remedio, ¿no? O sea, aquí ya no podemos ni sembrar. The food distribution is not going to solve the problem, or solve your problems. Look for the root causes. Nosotros creemos que las personas como nosotros vamos a impulsar un proceso de cambio.
Este día es importante para resaltar la necesidad de establecer una serie de políticas. La voz de las mujeres, la voz de las indígenas que tiene que ser escuchada. Hi, and thank you for having me uh, today and for your interest in the work of the Presbyterian Hunger Program. Um, my name is Valerie Nodem. I'm the Associate for International Hunger with uh, PHP. Um, in this presentation, I will um, explain what the Joining Hands Initiative of the Presbyterian Hunger Program is, and we'll zoom in um, and talk about the work that we've been doing um, in Congo around uh, mining. Uh, but before doing that, I would like to just quickly touch on our approaches of alleviating hunger and eliminate its causes um, globally. Um, PHP works uh, through you know, developing community-based sustainable development projects that ensure sustainable livelihoods. Uh, these projects empower people to feed themselves, their families and their communities in ways uh, that respect their culture the land and traditional knowledge. Um, we believe that those faced with the problems should be directly involved in developing solutions. That's why community-led approaches are at the center of our work to alleviate hunger and poverty around the world. Um, some projects within these categories um, would be uh, sustainable agricultural projects, water and sanitation, uh, economic development. The second big area of work for PHP uh, International is advocacy. Um, here we are, uh, we address policies and corporate practices that create or perpetuate hunger and poverty. Uh, much of our work uh, around advocacy globally is done through the Joining Hands Initiative, uh, which is a proven way to mobilize people in focused campaigns to tackle systemic causes of hunger, both in the United States and abroad. Um, we'll talk about joining hands more since that's the essence um, of this presentation. If you look at these um, 
slide, you will see that there's a continuum between the different approaches that we use in doing the work that we do. Uh, we try to move people and communities from addressing the symptoms um, of hunger and poverty to address root causes. Um, and our work uh, aims to support poor people by providing the resources that they need in order to move beyond levels of critical poverty. Uh, we understand that you can really address deeper issues if immediate needs are not being met. Um, and we create an environment where people gain opportunities uh, to realize their potential on cover resources which already exist within their communities. Um, people that way learn also new skills and analyze the systems that create or maintain people in poverty. Uh, ultimately, we envision um, communities where people are equipped to defend their rights and resources and participate in decisions that affect them. Uh, rather than replicate project-based mission, uh, presbyteries, congregations, organizations, and individuals are invited to partner with civil society networks in seven countries to organize in both the northern and southern hemisphere to campaign for change in a globalized world. Most of the issues identified by global partners as contributing to poverty abroad are also relevant in the United States. We look together at the immense troubles we all face on a small planet and pull together in prayer, research, repentance, and in the process of mutual transformation that reflects our shared commitment to global peace and justice. Through local, national, and international campaigns, joining hand networks address issues that cause and maintain people in poverty. With congregations in the US and presbyteries, PHP accompanies these networks and their communities as they come together to challenge the systems that generate hunger, poverty, and injustice. We support advocacy campaigns that aim to improve policies or corporate practices that impact fundamental rights to water, food, land, and other natural resources. In today's globalized world, with the high demand for food, water, energy, and other resources, poor communities that depend on these resources for their survival often face challenges to ownership, management of, and access to their natural resources. These communities are confronted with problems of seed monopolies, land grabbing, mining pollution, and trade policies that favor foreign investors over people. Powerful actors such as governments, private investors, multinational corporations, and multi multilateral banks in motivated by profit set policies that favor large scale extraction of resources with minimal or no benefits for local communities. Responding to poverty uh, through projects is not enough. If the systems that create or perpetuate hunger and poverty are not properly identified, analyzed, and challenged. So PHP supports the rights of local communities to protect their natural resources and livelihoods from destruction by large investment projects. Our partners' campaigns are also challenging corporate abuse and proposing solutions that are more people-centered. Uh, food and land. Through campaigns that promote food sovereignty, protecting and saving traditional seeds and land rights, we support efforts that promote the right of people to produce and consume food in accordance with their cultural traditions and through ecologically sustainable methods, as well as the right of people to own and access land to produce food and provide housing, particularly with indigenous communities whose traditional rights are threatened. Resource extraction and climate. The issues we're focusing here are transparency in a highly corrupt sector, uh, monitoring financial, social, and environmental obligations of oil, gas, and mining companies, protection from pollution, human rights, and rights to clean water and specialized health care. Many countries suffer from the resource curse where mineral and resource extraction create wealth for a few and rampant poverty for the vulnerable majority. PHP works with partners to advocate for transparency in payments made by extractive industry corporations to government. And we work to hold extractive corporations accountable for their financial, social, and environmental obligations. And PHP support communities impacted by pollution from mining by supporting campaigns that protect the environment and public health. Our partners see and recognize the progress that globalization brought in our everyday lives. They also recognize and see the many aspects of globalization that are modeled after colonization as it takes and extracts a lot uh, and doesn't always give back or respect people's life or the environment. 
Joining Hands promotes solutions that dismantle colonialism in trade relations, exploitation of natural resources, and the protection of the environment. Now, uh, we're going to zoom in uh, and talk a little bit about Joining Hands work in Congo. Um, we started working uh, in the Katanga region uh, with our partner, the platform of organizations involved in mining uh, in 2013. And Katanga is like the richest uh, province in Congo, um, richest in natural resources, uh, mainly mining. Um, so, um, as I'm sure, most of you here know Congo has very important extractive resources, mining, oil, and gas. Uh, the country is also among the world's uh, largest producers of cobalt, uh, copper, diamonds, tantalum, um, and tin, as well as several others. Unfortunately, despite its enormous natural potential, the country is also very poor. Last year, Congo was at the bottom of the Human Development Index as the country was ranked 175th. The current life expectancy in Congo is 60 years. The expected years of schooling is 9.7 years. 64.5% of the population lives in rural areas and in multidimensional poverty. Uh, to, increase, to increase growth and reduce poverty, the government counts a lot on its extractive sectors. Just to give you a data here, in 2018 only, uh, base metals and crude oil made up almost 95% of DLC's exports, 95%. Um, since 2002, Congo started huge legislative reforms and liberalized the mining sector with a new mining code. The increase of the metal prices on the global market attracted private investors, particularly in the copper region of Katanga. In 2013, DLC also elaborated a petroleum code Oil business, once concentrated in the coastal basin, um, is gra gradually expanding with exploration in the central and east basins, uh, like Lake Albert, Tanganyika, Moero, and um, Upemba. Since 2005, Congo is also involved in the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative and acquired the compliance status in July 2014. The country also started the process of transforming state enterprises into commercial companies. As of today, more than 100 private companies around the world, particularly around the country, sorry, particularly in Katanga, uh, are in the production phase. But that boom in the mining industry has a very little impact on improving living standards in DRC. The problems with the mining sectors, as identified um, by our partners, are due to weak laws, the non-respect of legal frameworks, years of civil war and a poor and unequipped administration, uh, financial embezzlement, uh, misallocation of public funds, lack of accountability and corruption. In general, the funds are not going where they're supposed to go, which is to the people and to build social services that will generate development. Um, PAM, the platform of organizations involved in mining, was created in 2009 by civil society organizations in Katanga. Um, the network became fully operative, operational in 2012. Um, they have 18 member organizations working on different sectors, human rights, environment, child labor, education, mining, land issues, gender. Um, and their goal is to improve the governance in the mining sector and make sure that communities can really benefit from it. Uh, and Palm works on three main areas. Uh, one is capacity building. They recognize the need to equip themselves, understand how the mining sector works, who are the actors, which ones have more power, uh, and also equipping and building capacities of their member organizations. Their second area of work is research and ana analysis. Uh, they produce a lot of resources, reports, video uh, documentaries to help understand what's happening and to analyze um, uh, the sector. And their third area is advocacy, where they formulate alternative solutions for a better governance uh, of the mining sectors. Uh, PHP started working with Palm in 2013. 
um, I mentioned the context of poverty in a uh, very rich uh, province and in a very rich country. Uh, through our visits uh, with Palm in the last couple of years, as you can see, a lot of communities in Katanga are seeing trucks day by day uh, taking mining uh, resources out of their communities, but they're not seeing much of it coming back. And they're living in a situation where they don't have the basic resources, water, electricity, um, roads, um, and food um, for their families. Um, and Palm has been doing a really amazing groundwork in terms of equipping communities, uh, working with uh, miners who are risking their lives, taking the resources out and are not often being paid or well paid. In the center picture here is Jean-Marie Kabanga, who is the current coordinator uh, of Palm in Congo. Uh, in the picture here on the far right is Ibond um, Anzam, who was the former coordinator. I really like this picture because they had made a, a documentary um, called Win Win, where they were talking to mining companies and telling them that this should be a partnership where each will win. Communities have to win and companies have to win as well. And this day they had come back to the communities to show them the documentary. Um, and that was very, very, uh, very deep. Um, but Palm is not only working on the ground, they're also working at the higher levels and meet regularly with uh, the government, uh, mining companies and other actors as well who are involved in the mining sectors in Congo. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, Palm was invited um, to go and train mining companies and explain to them what are the provisions of the mining, the new mining code because the company was really confused um, in inter interpreting um, some of them. Um, people very often ask us, you know, what is the result of all of that? When we're talking about advocacy and campaigns, you often see a lot of people talking, a lot of people in meeting rooms. Uh, Palm in Congo is actually one network that um, in less than 10 years have had tremendous uh, victories in their work. Um, the first one and the most important one, I think, um, is that they succeeded in working with others to have the government finally uh, adopt a new mining code in Congo. Since 2018, uh, the country uh, put together uh, a new mining code. Um, and there are three provisions that are really important and that had been pushed by Palm um, and a lot of other companies. The first one is that mining companies must pay 15% of their mining royalties to decentralized uh, territorial entities for the construction of community infrastructure, uh, like roads and bridges and schools and hospital. And just two years ago, almost $300 million was invested in Lualaba province and $190 million uh, in Ho Katanga for the construction of rehabilitation of infrastructure. Just so you understand that the mining royalty existed before, but it was paid at the national level and again, with the context of corruption, very little of that money was going back to the communities. So that was the first victory. The second one, um, or the second provision of the mining code that was also really interesting, was to ensure that communities are involved in the negotiation, development and signing of contractual obligations with mining companies in their areas. POM has worked with a lot of communities to negotiate contract obligations with neighboring mining communities. What that means is that communities are sitting on the table now and they're able to really have their voices heard directly rather than having other people always speak for themselves. They're sitting at the table uh, and that's huge in a country like Congo. The third one, um, the third provision that was really successful is that mining companies now must contribute 0.3% of their gross annual revenues towards social develop a social development fund for affected local communities. Um, this is the place where work, uh, Palm is still working to like make sure it's fully implemented, but only this 0.3% uh, will result again in hundreds of millions that will be paid back to local communities. Uh, the second victory for Palm is that rather than waiting for these funds to come to communities and have potential conflicts coming because the money is there, 
they spent the last three years training communities and talking about how do you want to man manage the money when it comes? What are some of the priorities um, that you see, you know, in terms of like infrastructure or development project in the communities and bringing all the voices together to make sure that there's less conflict when the money is there. And that has been really, really well done. Um, but the third and most important one is that uh, change is already happening a lot in their communities. Um, we have seen in the last couple of months uh, pictures of, um, you know, ambulances, uh, new hospitals being built, uh, new schools, uh, roads being fixed, um, and, and communities just feeling like finally it's starting to happen. And that has taken years of work to get to that level, which is why, again, supporting that work of doing advocacy takes time. But when we're working with partners like Palm, at the end, we really know that um, you know, there will be victory. We've been really, really, really excited. Uh, for the work they're doing in Congo. Thank you very much. The history of SDOP. SDOP's history starts with the invitation to James Foreman to speak at the United Presbyterian Church in 1969. James Foreman, born October 4th, 1928, died January 10th, 2005 was an American civil rights leader active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Black Panther Party, and the International Black Workers Congress. The Black Economic Development Conference, which grew out of a national conference of the same name, was held in Detroit, Michigan on April 26, 1969. James Foreman became the spokesman of BEDC and the Black Manifesto became its platform the BEDC asked for $500 million in reparations from white churches and synagogues and said the monies would be used for nine projects. Among those projects outlined were a black university, a communication system, and a Southern land bank. In 1969, Foreman presented the Black Manifesto to the United Presbyterian Church at the 181st General Assembly in San Antonio, Texas. The Presbyterian Church listened thoughtfully to Foreman, though the message was uncomfortable. In response to Foreman's presentation, the 182nd General Assembly in 1970 of the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America gave final approval to the plan to raise funds for the Self-Development of People program. The first meeting of the National Committee on the Self-Development of People was held September 29th and 30th, 1970. The committee met with a mandate from the assembly to use funds in depressed areas and among deprived people. 50 years later, the Presbyterian Church remains committed to that mandate. SDOP mandate and criteria. For 50 years, the mandate of the Presbyterian Committee on the Self-Development of People has been to assist the Presbyterian Church USA in carrying out its global commitment to work towards the self-development of economically poor, oppressed, and disadvantaged people who own, control, and benefit directly from projects that promote long-term change in their lives and communities. The mandate was established by the 182nd General Assembly of 1970 of the former United Presbyterian Church and reaffirmed and approved by the 199th General Assembly, 1987, of the Presbyterian Church USA. SDOP methodology and process. Criteria for funding. The following standards are used to determine whether a project is valid for funding consideration within the ministry. A project will be presented, owned, and controlled by the group of people who will benefit directly from it. Address long-term correction of conditions that keep people bound by poverty and oppression. Describe in detail its goal, the point of the project, its objectives, the specific steps the group will take to accomplish the goal, 
the way the direct beneficiaries will be involved in all stages of the project and the methods to be used to achieve the goal and objectives. The Reconstruction Era, 1865 to 1877. The intersecting link between racism and farming has always been land ownership. Despite the work of abolitionists who fought to end the system of slavery, many of them were unconcerned or unclear about how formerly enslaved black people would transition socially and economically to freedom. In 1865, the year that marks the end of the Civil War, Part of the emancipation of black people as slaves included the U.S. government's offer of 40 acres and a mule, which was intended to give black people the means to support themselves. Of course, large-scale land acquisition was made possible because many Confederate planters fled and abandoned their land in fear of the Union Army. These 40 acres, or Field Order 15, as it was then known, was reversed by President Andrew Johnson after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Land, the resource in question, was returned to former slave owners. As a result, the Freedmen's Bureau, established by Congress in 1865 to help millions of formerly black enslaved people, could no longer guarantee those same people land or protection Instead of giving blacks the means to support themselves, the federal government instead empowered former enslavers by failing to keep its promise. The 40 acres reversal rendered independent farming in the South for black people unobtainable. The government's reluctance to implement land settlement programs would further disenfranchise black people, forcing masses of black laborers back into de facto bondage. This de facto bondage took the form of either land tenancy, which meant that one could use the property for a specific amount of time, care for and benefit from the land, or sharecropping, which is a legal agreement, which a landowner allowed a tenant to use the land in return for a share of the crops produced on that land. In either case, each arrangement did not constitute land ownership in each case, very little capital was attained by black farmers who were in these arrangements. Racial terror and voter suppression tactics greatly weakened black political voice, which compounded the lack of land ownership through legal means. 19th century to the present day. By the early 20th century, Black people had made considerable progress in acquiring land and the ability to farm independently. In 1900, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there were 25,000 black farm operators in 1910, an increase of almost 20% from 1900. Black farmland in Mississippi totaled 2.2 million acres in 1910, some 14% of all black owned agricultural land in the country and the most of any state. By 1890, the second Morrill Act was passed, which established state agricultural colleges for black students. Booker T. Washington, an early black civil rights figure, would become integral in promoting farm improvement and education. In 1920, despite discrimination and violence by white landowners and lenders, Black independent farming was at its greatest height. Black farmers operated 925,710 farms. Between 1920 and the present day, there has been a fundamental decline in black farming. In 2020, according to the Census of Agriculture, the number of black farmers in the United States had fallen to 45,000, comprising only 1.4% of all farmers. Systemic racism over the course of US history would eliminate black farming. 
Redlining and other forms of racial discrimination would deny African Americans the wealth building opportunities needed to obtain capital and land. The discrimination practices of banks and government agencies would contribute to the shrinking number of black farmers and their farms as well. The unequal administration of federal policies intentionally excluded black farmers. Such policies would raise farm commodity prices by reducing production, ignoring the rights of black tenant and independent farmers. Exploitative practices by white landowners consisted of acts such as pocketing government benefit payments for decreasing acreage rather than pay sharecropping tenants. Discriminatory practices in federal relief fund distribution disproportionately favored white farmers. Discriminatory federal farm policies and private lending institutions help contribute to the decline of black farming. According to the Center for American Progress, 1920 to 1978 marks a period black farmers lost 36 million acres of land. Today, compared to white owned farms, black farmers generate much less income. But there is hope. There are a growing number of black farmers and black farming organizations that seek to change the declining trend. Groups like Soul Farm and the Black Dirt Collective exemplify the importance of advocacy and activism as critical aspects of black agricultural work and life. These groups and many like them seek to address the issues of injustice and racism in the food system. They bring knowledge, passion, education, and hope for a new generation of black farmers. A few black farms funded by the Presbyterian Committee on the Self-Development of People. The West End Beltline Farmers Market is a project by the Georgia Women in Agriculture, a Georgia-based cooperative Provide, who provides locally grown produce and helps facilitate an environment where community members can learn agricultural skills, food security, food production, and sustainability. With a $15,000 grant from the National Self-Development of People Committee, the group was able to create the WEB Public Farmers Market, which promotes community and capacity building, provides greater community access to locally grown fresh food, and empower socially disadvantaged women in urban and rural areas. They also educate community members about nutrition and health and economic self-sufficiency and solidarity through agriculture. Young Farmers of the Low Country, Marshview Organic Community Farm, St. Helena Island, South Carolina. SDOP awarded them 13,700 the project is to learn to operate an organic farm through applications of environmentally safe organic food products, farm management, nutrition, and character training. Through training and mentoring from our advisors, we learn more about farm operations, organic farming skills, and how to operate small machinery. Koinonia Farm in Americus, Georgia received a $15,000 grant from Self-Development of People for its project that will allow the bakery manager to train in inventory, budgeting, and management. Funding will also be used to provide part-time employment to area residents and will support the ongoing life and work at Koinonia. Koinonia Farm was founded in 1942 as an intentional interracial farming community. It emphasized the brotherhood and sisterhood of all people. The farm hired seasonal help. Black and white workers were paid a fair equal wage. And when the community and its guests and workers prayed or ate a meal, they all sat together at the table, regardless of color. Their commitment to racial equality, pacifism, and economic sharing brought bullets, bombs, and a boycott in the 1950s as the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, and others attempted to force them out they responded with prayer, nonviolent resistance, and a renewed commitment to live the gospel. Among many other aspects of the farm, they created 
a mail order business which continues to sustain community today. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed, and they live with their backs constantly against the wall. Howard Thurman, from his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Self-development of people's work and ministry aligns with the Presbyterian Church USA's Matthew 25 initiative of poverty eradication. For more information, you can go to www.pcusa.org slash SDOP or HTTPS double slash www.presbyterianmission.org slash resources slash one great hour of sharing engagement map. For over 30 years, Medi Conga, an elder in the Presbyterian community of Congo, has been fostering development through PRODEC, the Program for Development in Kasai. Through the offerings of children in the former Orange Presbytery, now New Hope Presbytery and Salem Presbytery, Technical assistance and resources were provided by the Presbyterian Hunger Program to a fledgling project that has grown into a network of community associations addressing agricultural development, hunger alleviation, community health, and environmental sustainability. 
of particular focus has been women in out and development. And we will hear from both Mehdi and a woman farmer. Following Mehdi's presentation, we will move to Congo's capital city, where the Congo Leadership Initiative has been working with the Presbyterian community of Kinshasa in training young entrepreneurs. With an impressive record of success, this innovative program is taking Congo's most vital resource, its youth, and providing the training and skills to enable them to launch businesses, gain further education, and enter professions. Founders Nathaniel Houghton, Robert Kumkum, and two CLI alumni will share this remarkable story. Please stay with us following these presentations for the Q&A session when you can interact with the speakers. Bill, you muted. We would like to take a moment before we go on to recognize the loss of one of the great forest trees, uh, mm -hmm. Elder uh, Botacek. Nous aimerons prendre un moment d'annoncer le décès d'un grand baoba, uh, l'ancien uh, Eric Chesik. Chick. Check, but the check. <laughs> check, check. <laughs> and to uh, extend our sympathy to uh, our next presenter, John uh, Medi, uh, for the loss of his grandson. Et Présentant aussi nos condoléances à Papa Mehdi Kanda qui a perdu son petit-fils et qui sera le présentateur ou l'orateur de notre prochaine présentation. Thank you. Merci. Kanda, Comité national de PRODEC, Programme de développement du Kassai. Et je suis né à l'agronome. C'est avec une grande opportunité que je vais présenter la photographie de notre structure ONG PRODEC. Sans tarder, le programme de développement du Kassai PRODEC, c'est une ONG de la confession pétrienne au Congo, c'est une ONG nationale de la RDC qui a vu les jours en 1989, avec euh, l'appui de M. Doc Welch, de classe, qui est euh, l'initiateur de, de ce projet. PRODEC a comme domaine d'intervention l'économie sociale, qui est basée sur la cour pastorale, euh, basée aussi sur la gestion de l'environnement, la santé communautaire avec la progression de l'eau potable et lutte contre la malnutrition, éducation à la citoyenneté pour vitaliser la bonne gouvernance et la situation du mouvement paysan à la base. Et comme la carte le montre, PRODEC est au centre de Dekasai et précisément à Kabekamanga et en Moujimaï. Et puis nous avons aussi la concentration des actions PRODEC du côté de Mboujimaï, à Kabekamanga, nous sommes aussi à Kananga, il y a aussi des activités avec un bureau à ce niveau-là. Nous sommes à Chikapa avec des activités nutrition, nous sommes à Mweka et un peu partout dans les trois provinces du Grand Kassai. PRODEC a comme vision viser que les structures de base accompagné, soit professionnellement organisé, géré et constitue un pouvoir paysan fort, capable d'aider les producteurs à se, pro se, prendre, se pro euh, produire plus et bien commercialiser, 
défendre leurs droits et intérêts et s'ouvrir au monde pour un bon épanouissement. Codec a comme mission la situation et le renforcement du mouvement de fonctionnement des organisations paysannes à la base. Cela se traduit par le renforcement des capacités des leaders communautaires hommes-femmes, valoriser les compétences paysannes, de transférer les compétences de gestion des micro-projets à la structure de base. Les principes fondamentaux et les valeurs que PRODEC est en train de défendre, au cœur de toute l'action de PRODEC, il y a des valeurs fondamentales qui promet et défend. Il s'agit de la justice, l'équité, la solidarité agissante, la paix, une vision commune, la gestion la stratégie, bonne synergie, bonne gouvernance, et sauvegarde de l'environnement. Comme objectif général de PRODEC, il s'est attribué l'émergence des mouvements paysans dans son rang d'action où les producteurs assurent de façon professionnelle l'organisation, le fonctionnement et la gestion de leurs structures et projets de développement en vue de l'amélioration de leurs conditions de vie pour promouvoir le bien-être social. Réalisation et grand impact de PRODEC depuis son existence au terme de sa mission, PRODEC a fait de grandes réalisations récentes dans les différents domaines suivants. Actuellement, nous avons un mouvement paysan avec un réseau de producteurs avec cinq unions. Dans ces cinq unions, nous avons 123 OP avec 4623 membres. Et nous avons aussi disponibilité de 5 tonnes de, de semences d'arachide de bonne qualité stockées. Et dans les 5 unions, la vente groupée des produits agricoles est opérationnelle. Et comme stratégie, PRODEC travaille avec les unions comme ça se présente 5 unions. Et en dessous de 5 unions, nous avons les organisations paysannes. Et après les organisations paysannes, nous avons aussi les ménages agricoles qui sont aussi appuyés. Réalisation impact aussi, nous avons les activités généralistes des revenus exercées par les femmes pour lutter contre la pauvreté. Et nous avons 16 démonstrations sur la recherche paysanne sur la fertilisation des sols avec Titonia, Calacasa et autres. Nous avons des sites boisés avec les acacias, Mélina et autres essences forestières. Nous avons récemment construit quatre sources d'eau pour de servir en eau potable à la population en vue de lutter contre la, la maladie d'origine hydrique. Et nous avons aussi construit un entrepôt d'une capacité de 25 à 30 tonnes de produits. Nous avons 32 hectares de palmiers améliorés qui est en production active. Et nous avons 112 hectares de champs de culture vivrière dont maïs, manioc, rachid et nyebé bien installés. Et dans 5 millions de producteurs agricoles, nous avons 4 623 agriculteurs avec 18 451 ménages agricoles qui sont des bénéficiaires indirects des services des OP dans les ménages. Dans les AGR, nous avons diversification des activités de des revenus dans les ménages, dont nous avons la planification, les petits commerces et autres. Dans le grand défi que PRODEC est en train de relever, pour continuer à assurer son fonctionnement, PRODEC cherche à relever ce défi qui est la faible mobilisation des ressources financières locales, mise à niveau des agents PRODEC sur les techniques informatique de très haut niveau. Nous avons fait la productivité agricole liée à des multiples facteurs, à savoir environnemental, écologique, politique, technique et en intrants, c'est-à-dire les semences, 
des outils qui manquent. En perspective, pour assurer le fonctionnement, fonctionnement de PRODEC et durabiliser ses activités, PRODEC se mène pour intégrer les jeunes dans son programme de développement pour assurer la durabilité de l'action. Pour suivre l'encadrement des producteurs à maîtriser les techniques de production de semences de bonne qualité dans l'approche de l'agro de la culture familiale. En perspective encore, nous continuons à localiser les techniques de protection de l'environnement avec les recherches de chaque paysanne. Accompagner les membres des OP relations paysannes à connaître leurs droits et leurs devoirs pour mieux se défendre auprès de l'État et s'investir dans la lutte contre la malnutrition qui quête souvent les enfants de 6 à 59 mois. En conclusion, PRODEC travaille pour amener les paysans à se prendre en charge en vue de soulager leur misère, de connaître leurs droits et devoirs vis-à-vis -vis de l'État, l'idée à la protection de l'environnement. Tout ce que PRODEC a fait comme activité, il fut accompagné par différents partenaires et aujourd'hui qui continuent toujours à appuyer les actions PRODEC. Dans cette liste, nous pouvons citer Presbyterian Church, du GSA qui nous appuie, et nous avons aussi l'appui conseil de Doc Welch qui a euh, initié l'existence de PRODEC et continue toujours à nous appuyer. Et nous avons Ruth Brown. Et nous avons aussi le docteur Lachli qui continue aussi à appuyer PRODEC dans les volets nutrition avec les projets ACCR et MAN. Nous avons un aussi partenaire euh, de longue date, c'est Presbyterian All Mission qui continue toujours à appuyer PRODEC étant aussi membre de la CPC. Nous avons aussi le programme entre le programme Food Security. C'est un programme de lutte contre la faim qui a appuyé aussi quatre OP avec le programme de récupération des semences et la construction aussi d'un grenier de 30 tonnes de production. Et nous avons aussi les possibilités de assistance, émergence. C'est euh, un service qui a appuyé PRODEC avec les intérêts agricoles des familles sinistrées des communes à que nous avons connu précédemment. Et nous avons aussi Prosciter Women qui nous a appuyé aussi avec les palmiers pour la promotion des femmes, nous a appuyé avec les vélos pour aider les ménages à soulager la surface de la femme. Et nous avons aussi Human All Health qui continue toujours à nous appuyer dans trois, dans trois provinces, Kassa et Kassa et Centrale, pour lutter contre la malnutrition. Et nous avons aussi les foyers améliorés et les filtres d'eau potable. Nous avons aussi travaillé avec une des ressources banques, le programme Nicole Desbris, qui nous a appuyé longtemps avec la production des semences de Nyebe, Tarachit, de Manioc, pour aider les producteurs à avoir une bonne production. Et actuellement, nous continuons à travailler avec notre partenaire belge, pour Delic Delen, qui nous accompagne dans le renforcement des mouvements paysans et dans la recherche action avec les paysans au niveau de la base. Je dis et je vous remercie. Je suis un peu plus de 
Je suis président de l'OP Bayawaya de Roplam. Je veux témoigner le, le bienfait pour ce dépôt qui nous a été appuyé par le programme pour la lutte contre la pauvreté de PSU et ça. Avant tout, je voudrais me présenter et dire comment est-ce qu'on conservait nos produits. Bientôt là, on perdait 30% de nos produits suite à la mauvaise conservation de, de nos produits agricoles. Les mauvais emplacements euh, par des, des charressons et d'autres. Et aujourd'hui, la construction de ces dépôts nous a ravis nous a ravi de beaucoup de difficultés. Et maintenant là, et l'OP et l'Union, nous sommes tous contents pour cet appui. Ainsi, nous, nous aurons l'occasion de mettre nos produits de champ dans ces dépôts. Bientôt là, on doit mettre un comité de gestion mixte pour la gestion de ces... De ce. Nous avons M. Anaclé Nandou comme magasinier de ces dépôts. Nous avons Maman Chantal, notre secrétaire. Et puis, nous avons Maman Hélène, la trésorière. Papa Noé et Papa Willy sont chargés de surveillance de ces dépôts. Ok. Merci. La capacité de votre dépôt Bon, la, la capacité... Nous, nous avons estimé à, à 25 à 30 tonnes. Ici, c'est quoi Bon, nous avons mis de, de, des arachides et puis les maïs. Et ce n'est pas tout. Nous aurons à mettre encore d'autres euh, produits qui sont euh, éparpillés dans la cité. Les maïs. Les Hi there, my name is Nate Houghton. I'm the co-founder of the Congo Leadership Initiative and, and really excited to be part of the Congo Mission Network Conference once again. Obviously, wish we could be there uh, in person, but um, hopefully we can do that once again next year. Uh, Congo Leadership Initiative develops the next generation of leaders to be catalysts for peace and prosperity in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, we've trained about 4,000, a little more than 4,000 youth, young women and young men in 12 different sites across the DRC. Our training encompasses uh, leadership, uh, ethical leadership training, uh, selflessness, uh, as well as entrepreneurship skills. And our youth have started more than 500 businesses as well as been elected to provincial parliament, um, become doctors, lawyers, uh, created child psychology practices, and really pursued their own dreams and developed their country with their own skills. I first went to the Congo uh, uh, about 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, the first person I spoke with about the Congo was was Jeff Boyd. Um, my church, the Orchard Park Presbyterian Church, actually funded this first trip and I was exploring. I had some idea of working with youth. I thought that there was a great deal of untapped talent um, and it turns out I was right. Uh, and while I was in the DRC, just around the corner 
from the CPK offices in Kinshasa uh, in Limite. I went into an internet cafe to uh, to use the uh, the computer, and the owner of the cafe came up and asked me what I was doing there. That turns out to have been Robert, my co-founder, who you will meet here very soon. We've been working together for more than a decade. Um, again, really thrilled to be part of the Congo Mission Network Conference. Uh, certainly, the uh, uh, the Presbyterian Church is a critical part of our story, both in the United States and in the DRC. Even more excited this year because. We actually just completed our very first program with youth from Sepeka's schools in Kinshasa. You'll hear from a couple of the youth who are our recent alums who have just graduated um, from that program. And uh, as we speak, we are we are actually starting our program with uh, Sepeka in, in the Kasai region. Uh, so thrilled to have these partnerships really feel like we're coming full circle working with the Presbyterian Church in the DRC. Um, very excited about the future of our organization. We have every intention of continuing to grow. Uh, we are focused on the DRC specifically. We believe that it's a place with tremendous potential with uh, a, a very young population of talented individuals. And uh, we can't wait to scale, hopefully to reach 10,000 youth by 2025 is, is our goal. So we appreciate your um, your support as we as we move in that direction. Um, you'll hear, as I mentioned, uh, from our alumni, I think they have some very interesting things to say about our program, which hopefully sheds some light on the training itself. Uh, and then Robert and I will be available to answer any questions. We, we, we really very much want to have a dialogue um, with everyone at the conference. I think that's what I found to be one of the more gratifying elements of what we've done in the past. Uh, so looking forward to speaking further. Um, my uh, email address and contact information should be provided and I'll make sure that I do. Uh, if not, um, after after we speak here, um, but always happy to speak with anyone who's part of the Congo Mission Network about our work. Um, thank you again for your support and, and looking forward to the conversation. Bonjour, je suis Madame Marie Kouki, membre. Je suis de la CPK Communauté Presbyterienne de Kinshasa, membre au Conseil d'administration du département de la jeunesse, et j'ai eu la la grâce de participer à la formation qui était basée sur l'entrepreneuriat et les leadership. Déjà, je tiens vraiment à remercier tous les partenaires qui ont pu penser à la jeunesse congolaise, particulièrement à la jeunesse presbytérienne de Pekinjassa. C'est un outil qui a ajouté un plus dans notre vie de tous les jours. En tout cas, que le Seigneur sait, ne, ne cesse de vous bénir, que le Seigneur vous bénisse abondamment pour ce geste et combien important, combien considérable que vous avez fait à notre égard. Nous étions là pendant trois mois de formation et les formateurs étaient là dispo pour nous former et nous sommes bien formés là. Vous devez être rassurés que nous sommes bien formés. Nous avons eu cet outil-là qui va nous accompagner tout au long de notre vie parce que la formation c'est un investissement qu'on ne peut pas comparer à d'autres choses. On peut vous donner de l'argent mais quand on vous donne de la formation, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui va au-delà de moyens financiers, qui va au-delà de l'argent. En tout cas, nous sommes très reconnaissants envers vous. Nous avons eu toutes les théories concernant le leadership et l'entrepreneuriat. Alors, euh, nous ne voulons pas nous limiter là, parce que la théorie sans pratique n'est euh, rien. Nous avons besoin de pratiquer tous les enseignements que nous avons reçus tout au long de, ces formations, de cette formation pendant trois mois. Alors, euh, nous attendons encore à plus d'opportunités à deux courses parce que la majorité sont de jeunes parce que l'âge qui a été souhaité c'était entre 18 et 30 ans et nous sommes de jeunes nous avons tant de projets qui demandent aussi l'accompagnement qui demandent parfois des opportunités qui peuvent nous donner encore la possibilité d'aller plus loin avec la théorie que nous avons eue alors nous sommes là en train d'attendre avec l'aide du Seigneur et avec tout ce que vous pouvez avoir comme opportunité, comme bourse, comme offre, 
ça sera vraiment le bienvenu pour la jeunesse congolaise, particulièrement la jeunesse presbytérienne. En tout cas, nous sommes très flattés et nous continuons toujours à, à vous baigner dans nos prières parce que c'est un geste vraiment considérable. Que le Seigneur vous bénisse et que le Seigneur vous garde. Merci. Oui, bonjour. Moi, c'est le candidat pasteur Victor Kalombo, cadre de jeunes au niveau du département de la communauté presbytérienne de Kinshasa, CPK aussi. Je suis bénéficiaire d'une formation sur le leadership et l'entrepreneuriat formé par Congo Leadership. initiative qui était un cadre en tout cas bon la formation était de haut niveau des qualités qui nous a permis à acquérir de nouvelles connaissances mais aussi nous avions été énoyés ou émerveillés par cette formation qui était de de qualité qui nous a beaucoup aidé dans la vie courante. Je connais maintenant, en fait, je dirigeais même, j'ai été outillé encore davantage par cette formation en leadership. L'entrepreneuriat aussi n'était pas épargné et c'était aussi ça aussi la base. Je l'ai suivi, ça m'a beaucoup aidé. Je peux maintenant défendre ma communauté défendre mon titre d'un leader, un leader avéré, issu d'une très bonne communauté qui est la CPK, la communauté présidentielle de Kinshasa. J'ai joué plus de, donc de milliers de milliers de jeunes. Bien sûr, j'avais des lacunes, mais compte tenu de cette formation suivie, elle m'a beaucoup aidé dans l'entrepreneuriat. Euh, comment je peux gérer les ressources humaines et les ressources financières ou matérielles, quand bien même je l'ai suivi dans l'entrepreneuriat, bien sûr, j'étais bloqué maintenant pour le moment, comment je peux pratiquer surtout l'entrepreneuriat. Nous avons des projets qui nécessitent un financement qui jusque-là tarde encore, mais c'est là que je ne pas croiser les mots. Comme au cadre de la maison, je vais dans une église, mais si je veux être aidé dans ces sens-là à financer mon projet sur l'entrepreneuriat, ce financement sera vraiment bienvenu. Je remercie aussi euh, les partenaires qui nous ont, en tout cas, aidés à bénéficier de cette formation. Parce que ce n'est pas donné à n'importe qui qui va accepter de financer cette formation. Peut-être à des personnes qui ne connaissent pas, mais il a accepté de financer. Je vous remercie de tout cœur, vous qui êtes notre partenaire ou nos partenaires, si je peux dire comme ça. Mais le nombre de participants est, est vraiment restreint. Si vous pouvez accepter que vous élargissez les gens, au lieu des comptes, qu'on soit au-delà, non seulement les noms, mais aussi étendre cela dans des provinces. Parce que nous gérons les jeunes, pas seulement de la ville province de Kinshasa, mais aussi Congo entier. Nous avons des jeunes par-ci, par-là, qui demandent aussi d'être euh, bénéficiaires, d'être formés par Congo Leadership Initiative. Je vous remercie pour cela et ma demande est que la formation s'étende dans, euh, dans tous les pays sur l'entrepreneuriat et les leadership, que les jeunes soient aussi formés. Merci. Je vous remercie. Ok, 
But now, now is the time for your questions and your comments. I have a question from Dr. Serge to Valerie Dom um, Nodem. Merci. Nous entrons maintenant au moment des questions ou remarques. J'ai déjà une question de Dr. Serge qui est pour Valérie. Nodem. Euh, Dr. Serge. Uh, we're not hearing. We're not hearing you, Dr. Serge. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah, uh, congratulations to the all speakers. Félicitations à tous les orateurs. J'ai apprécié le, les sujets. C'était vraiment de, de bons sujets. I really appreciated the subject. Those were good topics. J'ai deux, deux questions d'éclaircissement ou basées sur euh, leurs expériences. Okay. And I have two questions for clarification and that is really based on your experience. Oui. Euh, quelle est votre appréciation par rapport à l'élan d'engagement des communautés vis-à-vis -vis des opportunités qu'elles ont? Comment What ils ont apprécié, oui, comment ils apprécient l'élan le, le, d'engagement des communautés vis-à-vis -vis des opportunités qu'elles ont? Uh, what is your, what is your take um, of the appreciation of the community? of the engagement towards the opportunities that they have. Et la deuxième euh, euh, préoccupation, comment ils apprécient l'appropriation de ces opportunités dans les différentes communautés, dans les différents pays? Est-ce que ça varie d'un pays à l'autre, d'une communauté à l'autre ou d'un continent à l'autre? Ok, si vous pouvez répéter, s'il vous plaît, appréciation. Oui, oui. Quelle est leur appréciation par rapport à l'appropriation des communautés? Le niveau d'appropriation de, 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 des opportunités que les, différentes, les différents projets. J'ai vu POM, j'ai vu PHP. Alors, l'appropriation le, 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 des communautés pour la pérennisation de ces opportunités, comment ils apprécient? Est-ce que ça varie d'un pays à l'autre, d'un continent à l'autre ou d'une communauté à l'autre sur base de leur expérience? OK. So, based on your experience, how do you uh, see, how do you know this community taking um, ownership or ownership. sort of... A Yes, um, uh, appreciating the opportunities or the different projects that are available to them. Do you see that uh, feeling of ownership, of taking ownership? Do you see varying uh, by community, by countries, by continents? How do you see it across the globe? Merci. Merci beaucoup pour la question. Um... Comme je n'ai pas la chance de parler en français tous les jours, je vais profiter pour vous répondre en français, surtout qu'on a la traduction maintenant. I got Merci. Uh, merci. Je, uh, thank you. I'm going to speak in French. I don't have the opportunity all the time. So if I have somebody asking me the question in, in French, I'll just speak in French if we have translation. Um, je pense que la, je vais commencer par la deuxième question. I'm going to answer the second question first. Uh, C'est une question très, uh, très simple, mais très difficile en même temps. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple and complex question at the same time. Parce que je pense que c'est très difficile de dire, bon, en Asie, on a plus d'appropriation qu'en Afrique ou en Amérique latine. So in Asia, uh, we have more ownership than in uh, Latin America. No, Saying it's really hard to decide if you have more appropriation from communities depending where we are in the world. Je, je pense que ce que nous on essaye de faire en général, c'est de sélectionner justement des groupes 
qui ont une bonne expérience de travail avec les communautés. So what we try to what we try to do is to choose to actually select uh, groups that have a better experience with communities. Et ça fait en sorte que quelle que soit la partie du monde dans laquelle on travaille, on essaye de travailler avec des groupes qui ont justement une bonne compréhension de leur travail et de bons rapports avec les communautés locales. So whichever group, whichever place that we work with, we try to take groups that have a good experience with the local community. Donc au Congo, ce qu'on voit par exemple avec Prodex, c'est que ils connaissent leur travail. Ils l'ont fait depuis plus de 20 ans déjà, depuis plus de 30 ans. So in Congo, what we notice is that they know what they're doing. They know the work with Prodex. They've been doing it for more than 20 years, 30 years. Ils n'ont pas beaucoup de ressources. Mais quand vous venez voir le travail qui est accompli avec le peu de ressources, l'impact est toujours trois fois plus que ce qu'on espérait. They don't have a lot of resources, but when you actually see the work that they're doing with the minimal resources that they have, the impact is always three times than what we hope for. Et ce qui est bien également, c'est que le travail que fait Prodec, vous pouvez voir que c'est leur travail. Ils n'attendent pas de l'extérieur on vient leur dire ce qu'il y a à faire. Ils sont des experts dans leur domaine. And you can see with product, they're not waiting for other people to come and tell them what to do. They're not waiting for foreigners or outsiders to tell them what to do. They're really experts in what they're doing. Um, et, et, et comment est-ce que les communautés apprécient? La première question, c'est comment ils apprécient l'opportunité qui leur est donnée. Moi, je, je reviens encore sur le cas de Prodec uh, pour dire que mon appréciation, c'est que comme une organisation qui n'est pas très grande, notre sentiment a toujours été que, quelles que soient les ressources qu'ils parviennent à avoir, ils les mettent justement au service euh, des populations de la meilleure manière qui soit. So, uh, for the first uh, question, how the community appreciates, I'm going to go back to product. They always appreciate what they have. They're always appreciative of what they have in brief. Et je voudrais saluer mon frère Mehdi qui est parmi nous parce que je crois qu'il a une très, très bonne capacité aussi à ne pas, euh, comme on dit en Afrique, mettre tous ses œufs dans le même panier. Okay, euh, il a I, su travailler. I would like to say also hi to my brother Mehdi, who is here. And they, he does what they say, like they say, or a, a, a saying that he doesn't put all the eggs in one basket. Uh, Mehdi est très, très bon pour travailler avec différents partenaires dans différents domaines, mais ça aussi, c'est parce qu'il a une vision claire. Il sait exactement ce qu'il veut accomplir et comment le diviser entre différents partenaires pour être sûr and, que le plan est accompli. And Mehdi is very, uh, is very clear in what he wants. He's a visionary. He knows how to work with different partners and in different aspects, in different domain, domains. So he knows what he, he's clear on what he wants. J'espère que je réponds à votre question. And I hope that was a good enough answer. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Jose has a question for Alonso. Jose a une question pour Alonso. My question is, uh, can local and international entities still solicit funds for community farming and gardening projects? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Jose, for that question. Uh, absolutely. But the one... Donc, est-ce que les communautés locales et internationales peuvent toujours faire une demande des subventions ou des financements pour leurs produits ou pour leur travail agricole? The difference, Jose, is that for low, for the national SDOP, uh, you can, you know, we will take applications uh, from any particular uh, entity. La différence est que pour uh, SDOP uh, national, on prend les applications, les demandes uh, uh, des, des entités différentes. For the international, we have been uh, working with focus countries. So we, pour, uh, du côté international, on travaille avec des pays ciblés. On cible des pays particuliers. Which simply means that it's not a come one and come all. 
We are uh, currently in several different countries right now. Our focus country uh, actually currently is Panama. Donc, ce n'est pas que on reçoit tout le monde, si je peux dire. Uh, donc, uh, présentement, on travaille avec un pays particulier qui est le Panama. And even though we have partnerships that uh, we're working with, uh, we are internationally, we are still staying with focus countries for the moment. Donc, uh, bien que on a des partenaires, mais uh, interna sur le point de vue international, on a un pays ou des pays ciblés. And so I hope that answers your question somewhat. Donc, j'espère que ça a répondu. J'ai bien répondu à votre question. OK. Uh, our, next, uh, our next questions, three questions, are for uh, Jean Mehdi, uh, Papa Nehdi, uh, from Sir, Dr. Serge, from Jose, and from Herb Long. So, Dr. Serge, uh, votre question pour uh, Monsieur Mehdi. OK. Donc, nous avons trois questions. Et uh, nous allons commencer avec le Dr. Serge pour Papa Mehdi. Félicitations à Papa Mehdi pour sa présentation. Papa Mehdi, really good uh, presentation. Congratulations. Yeah. I, 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 je voudrais savoir un peu euh, quels peuvent être le, les facteurs du faible engagement des jeunes tel que vous l'avez euh, énoncé comme défi de, de PRODEC. Ça, c'est ma, ma, ma première euh, préoccupation. So, my first question is, uh, what are the factors that uh, are involved or that are playing in the lack of engagement from the youth? From, from, as, you as you mentioned and, earlier in your presentation. Et puis, and la, la deuxième préoccupation, c'est pas une préoccupation. Uh, I appreciate uh, the quality of uh, the agricultural product of uh, Prodec. Can he send me a bag of corn? Thank you. A bag of corn? Of Je... corn. Pour... OK, j'apprécie vraiment la qualité uh, des produits uh, agricoles de Prodec. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'envoyer un sac de maïs? <laughs> Okay. Ask him if he has two devices on. Uh, Papa Medi, est-ce que vous êtes à côté d'un appareil électronique? Il y a des échos. Oui, on peut fermer. Je peux répondre à la question? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and answer the question. Okay. Oui. La faible participation des jeunes est justifiée par trois causes. Premièrement, notre euh, rayon d'action, c'est une euh, entité où il y a un peu de diamants dans les temps passés et les jeunes se donnaient toujours aux diamants. Okay. Mais actuellement, les diamants ne donnent plus encore un moment pour la traduction. Un moment, papa. Good. Okay. Maintenant, il commence maintenant à se donner yes. à la culture. <laughs> Alison, so uh, uh, my the answers for factors that are uh, playing into the lack of participation from you, the youth is there are three factors. The first one is it's due to diamond. So we used to or they used to be cultivating diamonds um in the past but now there is our entity there is really little diamonds uh, so the youth are not really interested anymore bon maintenant euh, avec euh, euh, l'appui de project les jeunes commencent maintenant à se donner au travail agricole parce que ça rapporte plus maintenant pour le moment c'est une source de vie et source de revenus pour les jeunes actuellement So now with uh, uh, product being uh, very good with this agricultural product or farming product, it has become a good source of revenue uh, for the daily lives. So now uh, the youth are more uh, implicated. Et comme vous le savez actuellement, nous sommes en train de lutter pour que la rentabilité agricole soit à un certain niveau pour récompenser les producteurs. 
dans les jeunes, c'est dans cette activité et que la rentabilité n'est pas favorable. Il y a des fois où les jeunes commencent à désister un peu. So we're really fighting that uh, we can get a really good revenue from these uh, farming products because if the revenue is not really good, the youth are kind of uh, becoming, uh, they have lack of motivation. Now, with the support of PHP, with the agricole, agricole, with the vélo, the young people have found that it is important to have an agricole activity et commence à financer leurs, leurs, leurs études à partir de la nature qu'on est en train de localiser dans notre entité. So now with the, the, the gift of uh, bicycles and uh, farming tools, it's starting to interest the youth more and more and they can actually pay for their studies. Et en même temps aussi, nous donnons aussi les crédits aux jeunes pour les agères, pour l'activité de revenus. Les jeunes sollicitent l'argent et ils peuvent faire votre activité, faire l'élevage, faire le petit commerce et ça les encourage maintenant à intégrer maintenant le travail qu'ils sont en train de faire sur terre. And we also give credit to AGR. So it is interesting, it, it becomes interesting to the youth because they can also do other stuff, other things, uh, such as uh, a business, being involved in business and uh, animal farming. Is it, I can't remember, but animal, animal uh, raising animal. animals, uh, right? And uh, that is becoming interesting to them. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Merci My beaucoup. Bag. My bag of code. Okay. My um, second question. My second question, my sack of maïs. I'll be in Kananga and you'll have it. My question uh, uh, deals with, uh, are there any projects or, or plans for projects in bamboo forest farming, uh, which is a great building uh, material? Est-ce que il y a des ma, ma question est-ce qu'il y a des projets où il y a uh, est-ce qu'il y a un, un, un planification des projets pour uh, la l'agriculture ou uh, le commerce des bambous vu que c'est un très bon produit pour uh, la construction. Bon, pour le moment, nous avons organisé la vente groupée des produits agricoles. Les unions ont des petits moyens financiers qui sont en train d'acheter les produits des de, de producteurs pour vendre à un moment opportun. Pardon, papa, mais dit ça, ça coupait de mon côté. Est-ce que vous pouvez répa, euh, répéter, s'il vous plaît? Je, pardon? Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter ça, coupé de mon côté? Oui, je peux dire que euh, pour le problème de vente de produits agricoles, les unions ont, nous avons cinq unions. Chaque union a un peu de moyens, de capital pour acheter les produits agricoles groupés. Chaque union, chaque OP amène sa production au niveau de l'union. Les unions achètent les produits agricoles et revendent aussi à un moment donné pour donner des dividendes aux producteurs. OK, so concerning uh, agricultural products, we have unions that pretty much they buy those uh, farming products and then sell them back uh, to, um, to farmers. So they pretty much sell them back to farmers and they use those dividends. Christy uh, wanted to make sure that we understood the role of the depot uh, and how by holding products until the price goes up. If, if um, uh, Mr. Medi could speak to that. Monsieur Medi, est-ce que vous pouvez parler uh, de, de l'engagement ou le rôle de dépôt? Oui. Le dépôt a un grand rôle. C'est un dépôt communautaire. Et comme le bénéficiaire l'a expliqué, dans la production agricole, on a constaté que c'est 30 des pertes de production agricole. Si okay, ce n'est so pas bien, c'est fait. The warehouse has a big role. We had noticed that uh, there was a 30% loss in those farming products. Et maintenant, avec les conditions réunies, les producteurs peuvent conserver leurs produits dans les meilleures conditions 
pour lutter contre les rats, contre les charançons et contre l'humidité. So with those uh, warehouses that have been created, the farmers, they can now store the products and uh, it can, they can store the product to prevent it from having rats and uh, humidity. Et ils peuvent aussi vendre à un moment où la production a une valeur rémunératrice pour les paysans et ils assurent aussi une bonne gestion. And they can sell back at a time where productivity is very high, so when they can have a higher return, and it also uh, ensure productivity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Herb, Herb Long wants to ask uh, a question for Mr. Medi as well. Monsieur Long a une question pour vous aussi, Papa Medi. Okay. okay, go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you for your presentation because I, re I read a lot about the problem of food security in the Congo. So thank you for the work that you and PRODEC do. Merci beaucoup pour le travail que vous et PRODEC uh, vous êtes en train d'effectuer parce que je fais beaucoup de lectures sur uh, la sécurité alimentaire au Congo. <coughs> My question is, is more of a organizational question. How many are on the staff at PRODEC and what is your annual budget? Just estimate. My question is du, uh, du côté organization, du côté structurel. D'abord, combien de personnes sont sur, combien de personnes travaillent pour vous? Uh, donc, uh, de combien de personnes est composé votre personnel? Et puis, quel est votre budget annuel? Juste une estimation. Merci pour la question. Euh, PRODEC actuellement totalise euh, sept techniciens euh, dans son sein. Moi-même, ingénieur agronome, avec des autres ingénieurs agronomes, avec des techniciens. Et une femme aussi, technicienne aussi, qui sont avec nous. Nous sommes, nous sommes au total sept techniciens qui travaillent au PRODEC. So we're a total seven technician that works at product, myself included, as well as a woman uh, uh, who is uh, one of the technicians. So total seven. Okay. And then uh, um, le budget annuel. Bon, le budget annuel, nous avons notre partenaire uh, BD. Uh, C'est une ONG belge qui nous appuie avec 50 000 dollars par an annuellement pour appuyer le mouvement paysan et nous encadrons. Et chaque année, nous recevons aussi euh, 10 000 dollars de PHP pour appuyer les OP dans la production de semences agricoles et dans la formation. Et en plus aussi, nous recevons le fonds des IMA pour à, lutter contre la malnutrition. C'est jusqu'à 100 000 dollars annuellement. Ça, ça varie de temps en temps, ce n'est pas fixe, mais ça, ça dépend des, des programmes, euh, le contrat signé avec l'IMA. Okay. So I'm going to say in brief, we have help from a, a, a partner called DDP. They are an NGO from Belgium and they assist us with about $50,000 a year, roughly. Another partner, DHP, they assist us with about $10,000 in funding annually. And that really goes in production of our uh, seeds and also in training. And then we have another organization that helps us with malnutrition specifically. And that is about 100,000, but that amount varies from year to year. Et je peux donner une précision. Uh, du Conseil Kassai Central, nous avons les animateurs. Ce sont des personnes uh, contractuelles des prestataires de services que nous avons engagés comme animateurs et qui travaillent. Nous sommes au nombre de 15 animateurs qui interviennent pour l'éducation nutritionnelle au niveau des zones de santé. C'est ce qu'on est en train de faire avec l'image de l'autre côté du Kassai central. And then one more thing is in uh, Central Kassai, we work with about 50 consultants. Uh, I'll say, they call animateur, but I'll say 50 consultants. 
that work with us, they are pretty much educator in terms of nutrition and they work in our health centers. Thank you. Sure. All right, uh, we have several questions for Nate uh, about the uh, Congo uh, Leadership Initiative and we'll, we'll go right back to Herb. Uh, he had a question, well, he's still right there. Uh, and then we'll go to Millie. Okay, nous allons commencer avec uh, une question pour Nate concernant le, excuse me, concernant l'initiative de leadership. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nate. I think we uh, all appreciate that the, uh, the hope that we have in each of our countries, whether it's the Congo or the United States, is, uh, is, prov is provided by our youth and their ideals and values. So, first of all, thank you for your work. Merci beaucoup pour votre travail. Nous avons beaucoup d'expérience dans notre pays, que ce soit au Congo ou aux États-Unis. Cette expérience fournie par la jeunesse. Donc, merci beaucoup pour votre travail. I, I have actually three questions. One, I'm just interested in what is your, shall we say, your home church? in the United States. But secondly, the curriculum that you use, your training process, did you develop it yourself or is this one that was already in use elsewhere? And then the third question is, do you help, once the youth are trained, do you then help them find opportunities to apply their training. Yeah, I believe you're muted. Question. Yeah. D'abord, quelle est votre église locale ici aux États-Unis ou quelle est votre église mère La deuxième question, le curriculum que vous avez ou bien la formation que vous donnez, est-ce que vous avez développé ça vous-même ou vous avez pris ça quelque part La troisième question, euh, c'est Est-ce que vous aidez les jeunes une fois qu'ils ont été formés? Est-ce que vous les aidez à trouver des opportunités pour uh, pouvoir appliquer cette, uh, cette théorie ou cette formation qu'ils ont reçue? Sure, thank you for, for the questions. And by the way, I've gotten several chat questions. Uh, Robert is feeling sick, so I will cover for him. But if you're looking for Robert, he'll be back at some point, I promise. Uh, D'abord, j'aimerais dire que Robert, malheureusement, n'est pas là. Il est un peu malade. Donc, uh, certainement, il va revenir plus tard. Il est malade à la tête. Il vient de l'hôpital. <laughs> um, so, the home church, I'm, a, I'm extremely nomadic. <laughs> I think I've, I've lived in several places. Um, my home church is Orchard Park Presbyterian Church, just south of Buffalo, New York. Uh, D'abord, pour mon église locale, uh, je suis un peu nomade, j'ai fait le tour de plusieurs églises, mais pour le moment, je suis à Orchard Park uh, Presbyterian Church qui se trouve à New York, uh, dans la ville de Buffalo. Um, the third question I'll address next, which is, the, the short answer is yes. We think it's very important to provide opportunities for the youth after the training. Donc, je vais d'abord aller à la troisième question. Uh, la réponse est oui. Nous aidons, aux, nous aidons les jeunes à trouver des opportunités une fois qu'ils ont été formés, parce que c'est vraiment uh, important. And, and, and one way we do this is by providing uh, funding for businesses and social projects directly. Donc, uh, nous le faisons ça, premièrement, la première façon, c'est uh, donner des, des affaires, des business uh, dans des agences locales ou des agences de société, dans la société. Uh, Obviously, we're somewhat limited. I think we received 250 or 300 applications for 75 or so projects. So that, that's, we can't do everything with that. Et, mais malheureusement, nous sommes vraiment limités parce que avec 75 ou 75 projets, nous recevons plus de 300 applications. Um, we also provide connections with other organizations and opportunities, including scholarships, jobs, um, Hopefully in the future, some internships, uh, fellowships, those types of things. 
et nous euh, fournissons aussi des connexions avec euh, d'autres agences ou d'autres euh, partenaires euh, en forme de bourse, de travail. Et nous espérons dans le futur à faire aussi des stages et aussi des fellowships. Des... Un stage. <laughs> um, et la deuxième question est la plus intéressante. Um, so, we do have a curriculum. Um, it is constantly being updated. Uh, but I think it's the, the Woody Allen quote, right? Like 80% of success is just showing up. So I don't know if you can translate that. <laughs> uh, la deuxième question, c'est que oui, nous travaillons avec un curriculum, mais ça, ça, c'est tout le temps mis à jour. Et si je peux utiliser le, uh, une phrase de M. Woody, c'est de dire que 80% c'est le présentiel, c'est être présent. Um, and so leadership training is not like learning physics or chemistry. You're not filling a vessel with knowledge. It's, you know, you could put a bunch of talented youth in a room, which we do, and have them discuss what they think leadership is. And that's most of the curriculum, <laughs> honestly. And I think that's really important to know. La façon d'apprendre le leadership, c'est vraiment différent. C'est pas comme... Uh apprendre les cours de physique ou de chimie, de remplir un vase de connaissances parce qu'on peut mettre les jeunes dans une pièce et c'est ce que nous faisons et demander selon vous, quel est le leadership? C'est quoi le, le leadership? And, and I think that with a focus on local leadership as well, this is important because it wouldn't be right for me to write a curriculum on leadership from Buffalo. <laughs> And, and tell people that they need to that they need to do things that way. Um, so that's always been a part of what we do. Et c'est vraiment important de se focaliser sur le leadership local parce que je ne peux pas écrire, uh, un, développer un curriculum qui vient de Buffalo, de la ville de Buffalo, de New York, et puis uh, le, leur apprendre ou le leur donner. Donc uh, c'est vraiment basé sur le leadership local. So, so to be clear, we we take you know, we take best practices from around the world. It's very important for us to have a strong curriculum, but we have 15 sites and it's probably delivered a little bit differently at each place, which we see as a strength and not a weakness. Uh, donc, uh, avec nos sites, nous avons à peu près 15 sites uh, 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 à travers le monde et nous utilisons les meilleures uh, pratiques, donc les meilleures évidences pour uh, les apprendre et puis, euh, le curriculum dépend de ces, de, dépend de ces, de ces lieux, de ces locations, de ces endroits. Et on trouve, pour nous, ce n'est pas une faiblesse, c'est plutôt une force. C'est plutôt ça qui fait notre force. Thank you, merci. Thank you. OK. Uh, Millie Cox, a question for Nate. Microphone, Millie. Microphone. All right. <laughs> Can you hear Go me? Ahead. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? Go, Millie. Okay, great. Um, first of all, thank you all the pre presenters. This was fascinating and I learned so much. And Nate, this is the second time I've heard your presentation. I heard your presentation in Knoxville and was greatly inspired. Thank you and Ro Robert Rivera. Et la, la question est de Madame Milly. Euh, D'abord, merci à tous les présentateurs, pour les orateurs pour euh, cette, euh, ces présentations. Les sujets sont vraiment intéressants. Et à Nate, euh, merci. C'est la deuxième fois que je vous écoute. La première fois que c'était à Knoxville. Yeah, so Nate, I'm greatly interested in your expansion in Canada. Um, I'm, I'm interested. How are you recruiting for your leadership project there? Who are you working with? Who is your point person there? Um, and are the students, do they come after school or do they come during the summer? If I understood correctly, it's a three month training project. Um, so just interested in that. Okay, j'aimerais savoir comment est votre projet de recrutement uh, pour uh, les leaders? Comment est-ce que vous, quel est votre, um, quel est votre outil de recrutement, si je peux dire? Et puis aussi pour les jeunes, est-ce que vous les prenez ou vous les recrutez pendant l'été, le, le, les vacances? Parce que si je comprends bien, c'est un uh, programme de trois mois. And sorry, point of clarification. That was the, the expansion to, did you, say, you cut out CPC or was that, or to, okay. Yeah, the expansion to the CPC. 
Um, so I'm very interested in that and who the point person is and how we can find out more about it. OK. Et j'ai aussi une question concernant l'expansion de CPC. Uh, qui contacter? Qui, qui est le point de contact? So all of our expansion is managed, is managed locally. Um, so Pastor Mboyamba is, is, is one of the point people. Um, that's, that's something that uh, Robert and the team work with the local, local leadership to, to launch. Nos, nos projets d'expansion sont faits localement, donc c'est quelque chose que, par exemple, le pasteur Mboyaba travaille dessus, et c'est aussi Robert qui se charge de cela, il est dans cette équipe qui se charge de cela. The program is more accurately described as 50 hours, so that could be done over three months, you could do it over two weeks, I wouldn't recommend it, um, but it's extremely flexible depending on what the schedule like is like, typically it's on weekends. Typically it's on weekends? Oui, yes. oui, oui, le week-end. Ah, donc le programme, le programme, il est vraiment programme, de 50 heures. Donc vous pouvez le faire en trois mois ou en deux semaines, ce que je ne recommande pas. Uh, mais c'est vraiment uh, fait pendant les week-ends. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead, Belly. And how do you recruit? How do people learn about it? How do you publicize it? It's all locally led, so um, it depends on where where the, where the youth are in a church. Obviously, it's pretty direct, okay. um, but that's that's all led at the local level. Oh, okay. Thank Et you. Le, uh, la façon dont nous recrutons les gens, c'est vraiment fait. Uh, 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 c'est fait dans le domaine local. Donc, ça peut être dans les églises. C'est dans la communauté locale. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and Crane. Your microphone. Trying to unmute myself. Okay, you're good. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to uh, add my thanks to all of the presenters for your uh, excellent, fascinating, and very informative presentations today, and to Dana uh, once again for your uh, your excellent translation services. Um, and I want to hold up today in memory. Um, our brother and friend Botacek, who's uh, whom we've been mourning, whose loss we've been mourning this past week, um, he was uh, uh, played an important role in the founding of the Congo Mission Network long before I got involved um, in his role as mission interpreter and mission facilitator and um, a leader of. Uh, of uh, trips to the Congo and, and in the US. So uh, um, I hope that- Translation. All mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I got you, I got you. Okay. Uh, D'abord, j'aimerais dire vraiment encore un grand merci à tous les orateurs, à des sujets très intéressants. Uh, uh, vraiment, pour moi, c'est de la bonne information. Et puis aussi, la deuxième chose que j'aimerais adresser, c'est la mort de notre ami, notre frère, papa tchèque, qu'on a perdu, que nous pleurons euh, sa mort depuis la semaine passée. Il a vraiment joué un rôle très important dans euh, la formation de ce network, de Congo Mission Network, ou du réseau de la mission congolaise, en tant qu'interprète, en, euh, euh, en tant que leader de tous les voyages, que ce soit des États-Unis au Congo ou du Congo aux États-Unis. Uh, and I have a question for Nate and Robert, if he is, if he is back on. Um, do you see a role for uh, young people in the Congo and in the U.S. to take more leadership in the Congo Mission Network as we plan for our future gatherings and future work. This is something you may not necessarily be able to answer on the spot, but uh, if you have any thoughts on that, and I would like to invite other people to think about that too, as how we can involve um, young people more in the leadership of the Congo Mission Network. Et ma question, ma question est pour Nate, ou aussi Robert, s'il est déjà revenu, s'il est revenu, s'il est là. 
mais est-ce que vous voyez, comment est-ce que vous voyez, ou est-ce que vous voyez si les jeunes du Congo ou des États-Unis peuvent jouer un rôle, ou quel est le rôle qu'ils peuvent euh, prendre en tant que leader ou un rôle de leadership dans le Congo Mission Network? Uh, I mean, the answer has to be yes, by, by nature of how these things evolve, right? <laughs> like like yeah, young people become older and then younger people come, right? So, um, so no, I think that's true, right? Uh, donc oui, juste par le fait que uh, les jeunes grandissent et c'est comme ça que le monde uh, fonctionne, c'est comme ça que le monde uh, tourne. And, and on, in the Congo, right, I think median age is still probably somewhere around 17 or 18, so... It's hard to do a training program for the general population that isn't focused on youth. Et au Congo déjà, uh, l'âge moyen est de 17 ou 17 et de 18 ans. Donc c'est difficile de faire un programme qui n'est pas centré, qui n'est pas focalisé sur les jeunes. So I, I think it's I think it's necessary. Um, I think that there's some steps that can be taken to make it easier, but ultimately it'll be up to individual young people to decide if it's a priority of theirs. Je crois que c'est nécessaire uh, et il y a des étapes à franchir uh, pour y arriver, mais je crois qu'en même temps, ce sera des, une décision individuelle uh, que les jeunes doivent prendre. OK. Thank you. Merci. Uh, Jose, question for Nate. Uh, yes. Hi, Nate. Thanks again to, to you for your presentation and to everyone. This has been really cool. Really, really informative. Um, I guess you answered my the, the first part of the question, how the students learn about the opportunity and how they're selected. Uh, but uh, kind of following up on Herb's uh, comment uh, about opportunities, is there an investment fund uh, from which graduates can solicit funds to begin businesses? And, and does this fund go to support future trainings and future businesses, kind of a Berkshire halfway of the Congo. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jose, can you repeat the last part? I was putting it down. Okay, sorry. Is there an investment fund that uh, the graduates can uh, request funds to start their businesses from? And then does, do, do they give back a uh, uh, profit, a portion of their profits so that it can go to future trainings and to future businesses? Okay, okay. Uh, ma question est pour uh, Nate et vraiment c'est un suivi du, de la remarque de Monsieur Herb. Est-ce qu'il y a un fonds d'investissement que les, ceux, qui sont, ceux qui ont fini le programme, que les jeunes qui ont fini le programme peuvent uh, demander et si oui, peuvent demander d'abord pour faire un business, pour faire des affaires. Et si oui, est-ce qu'il y a moyen pour eux de remettre cet argent pour utiliser ce, 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 ces bénéfices pour des formations futures? Um, it's a surprisingly complicated question. It's part of the answer. As it stands today, a uh, part of our budget is devoted to, to this exactly. Uh, C'est une question compliquée, uh, mais pour le moment, notre budget, uh, une partie de notre budget est vraiment fait pour cela. And the point of that is to see what the returns look like, um, to, to understand les, les, les chiffres de, de, de business comme ça. Okay. Et uh, c'est vraiment pour uh, comprendre, to understand the business return, to comprendre le, les chiffres de retour. Um, so far, it's tricky because there are a number of really big winners and a number of projects that don't return the capital. Mm -hmm. So on average, it looks pretty good. <laughs> on, a, on a loan by loan level, it doesn't. So what we do about that is interesting, right? Okay, uh, just in brief, donc, uh... Jusque là, c'est un peu compliqué. Euh, jusqu'à présent, c'est un peu compliqué. Donc, il euh, y a beaucoup de gagnants. Et jusqu'à présent, il n'y a pas beaucoup de retours sur euh, le capital. So, straight loans, I don't think are going to work, is, is the short answer, based on what I've seen. If we can put together um, 
and this is just a nightmare for translation, I apologize. If we can put together some sort of, uh, I mean, you know, there's some sort of pseudo equity, like revenue share type vehicle, uh, structure de finance, qui est un peu différent de, 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 than just like loans. That I think is what we'll have to, we have to get creative is, is kind of the way that we'll have to do this, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, donc, uh, la, 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 la vraie réponse ou la bonne réponse, c'est que des prêts, uh, si on doit faire des prêts, ça ne va pas fonctionner, ça ne va pas marcher. Donc, uh, si on peut faire des genres de structure de partage ou structure de revenus de partage, uh, si on peut faire cela, uh, ce sera un moyen, mais on doit être vraiment créatif, on doit être plus créatif. So, we need, we need some, some financial flexibility with that. Um, that runs us into some questions around regulation and what we're actually allowed to do uh, and what we're not allowed to do. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the, the numbers would support the numbers would support something that works. We just need to figure out the right way to structure it. And that's definitely on our roadmap. That's a goal of ours. Euh, donc, euh, on doit, une, nous devons à, acquérir ou nous devons arriver à une sorte de flexibilité financière. Et ça, ça va nous emmener à une autre question de, 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 régula, de, de règles du pays ou des règles en général. Euh, donc, qu'est-ce qui est permis, qu'est-ce qui n'est pas permis. Et en général, on doit montrer que les chiffres fonctionnent, les chiffres marchent. And just re really briefly, just to give you an idea here. So, we did about 6,000 in loans last May, those have turned into about 32,000 in revenue. So it's there. Um, it's just a matter of how we, how we capture that appropriately and what the structure we put in place is. Donc, juste pour vous donner une idée, on a uh, le mois, non, uh, le mois de mai dernier, ou l'année passée au mois de mai, nous avons eu à peu près 6 000 prêts. Nous avons fait 6 000 prêts et uh, le retour où les bénéfices étaient à peu près de 32 000 dollars. Donc, les chiffres sont là. Nous avons juste besoin d'une forme de structure pour les faire travailler. OK, thank you. Um, Jan uh, uh, Sullivan. Thank you, Nate, for your good presentation and others. Uh, very, very informative uh, session. I think my question was partially answered in with Herb's question about curriculum because I asked for the specific, uh, more specific uh, content of the training and what it's, um, how it's developed and, and introduced in the teaching sessions, but if you want to expand on that, it's all right, or okay. if you feel it's answered. Good to okay. see you. <laughs> Merci beaucoup encore, bonne présentation. Mais en fait, ma question, uh, ça a vraiment été uh, déjà répondu uh, par, uh, uh, à travers la question de Monsieur Herbs, qui était concernant le curriculum. C'est vraiment le contenu. Uh, J'aimerais savoir les détails du contenu de ce curriculum et comment ça a été développé. Je ne sais pas si vous aimeriez encore répondre, si vous avez quelque chose d'autre à dire sur cela. I think just to say, um, in, and I know this is a, it's a little risky given, given Jan's professional background, but I, think, like, I don't remember the specific things that I learned in my high school classes, but I did learn how to learn. And, and I think I learned how to, you know, how to, how to uh, gather and retain information. And, and so, you know, there's some things you remember, but, but I, again, I think we're trying to structure it in, in a very interactive way, which is totally different than the school model in the DRC today, right? So I think that's important as well. Okay. Uh, donc, en bref, j'aimerais dire que uh, la façon dont nous, nous développons ce curriculum, c'est pour que ça soit un peu plus interactif, uh, différent de la façon dont uh, les sujets ou les cours sont donnés ici au Congo. Et pour ajouter, c'est de dire que je ne me rappelle pas exactement des cours que j'ai appris, qu'est-ce que j'ai appris uh, à l'école secondaire, mais ce que je peux dire, Je sais que j'ai appris comment apprendre, comment retenir les choses, comment mémoriser les choses que j'ai appris. Although if Jan had been my teacher, I'm sure I'd remember everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure that would be. 
ma professeur, j'allais uh, uh, me rappeler de tout, j'allais tout retenir. <laughs> One thing I want to mention as well, and this is from the prior question from, from Jose, I, I think it's been an interesting discussion or an interesting presentation in some cases about, to some extent, about capitalism. Um, and, and I think it's, it's useful to reflect on that as we think through this structure, right? Okay. Donc, euh, pour euh, revenir à ce que José dit, je crois que c'est vraiment intéressant. Cette, cette présentation était vraiment intéressante et nous amène à réfléchir sur euh, cet esprit capitaliste, sur le capitalisme et euh, de, de, de réfléchir sur ces structures. Capitalism as a dogma is tremendously dangerous. And I think that's, you know, that's a place that we can get to that's, that's really, um, uh, it creates a great deal of inequality. It, it is not compassionate. It is deeply unjust. Capitalism is a tool, um, like putting together a unique financial structure so that we can fund young people's businesses in the Congo. That, that I think can be very positive. And I often think that that can be lost in, in this sort of good versus evil um, capitalism debate. I think it's useful to consider it as a tool. It's, a, you know, like if you have a hammer, you can really hurt somebody with it, but you can also do a lot of really good things. Okay. J'aimerais dire juste en bref, d'abord, le capitalisme lui-même peut être très dangereux. Euh, C'est euh, un, un outil qui, peut, euh, qui, a été, qui a créé des inégalités, euh, mais en même temps, euh, il peut être bon si on l'exploite si bien, si je peux dire en bref. Parce que si vous avez un outil tel qu'un marteau, ça peut être dangereux, mais ça peut être aussi avantageux. Good. Okay, thank you, Sue and uh, Nate. Good conversation. Uh, the rights have a question uh, to uh, had a comment about uh, engaging young people in the network. Yes, go ahead, uh, Fletcher. Uh, thank you. I guess you can hear me. Um, yes. Yeah, I am raised the question about youth participation, particularly in so far as leadership at CMN. I would agree with Nate. Um, and, and I think part of what he was implying was maybe participation precedes leadership. Uh, over the months, we have enjoyed uh, the quality and the content of these presentations. J'aimerais uh, d'abord uh, uh, dire, uh, faire uh, un commentaire sur ce que Nate a mentionné tantôt, sur la participation des jeunes à la CNM, donc uh, Congo Mission Network. Uh, la participation précède uh, l'engagement. Uh, donc, uh, uh, c'est quelque chose qu'on peut dire d'abord sur la qualité uh, des présentations de uh, Congo Mission Network. It, it occurs to me that um, someone could take excerpts from these presentations and maybe uh, have, say, three shortened presentations, like an hour each. And CMN leadership could promote churches to solicit um, or invite rather uh, youth participation in participating in those several presentations as a starting point. Okay. En bref, je peux dire on peut prendre beaucoup d'experts uh, pour participer ou présenter à ces, uh, à ces présentations, uh, mais le leadership de uh, Congo Mission Network peut prendre beaucoup des jeunes pour y participer. If the participation was successful in terms of numbers, uh, I would imagine that the youth could be coached into providing ideas as to how they would want to stay engaged on a continued basis. Et uh, du coup, si on remarque que la participation des jeunes est un succès, uh, on peut engager les jeunes à donner, de leurs, av à donner leurs avis ou les idées, uh, comment, uh, uh, comment aider à la continuité de ce projet. I, I can say from our part that uh, we would welcome, I believe, participation because we certainly struggle locally with getting youth involved in our Congo mission efforts as well. Pour, pour ma part, pour Myers Park, je peux dire qu'on va supporter la participation parce que déjà pour nous, c'est difficile d'engager les jeunes localement. Thank you again. Et merci beaucoup. 
Okay. Um, and right, we'll um, offer our closing prayer and then uh, we'll Bill, open. For Bill, general... we still have a hand up from Donna. Um... Oh, go ahead. Yes. Did yeah. you have a question or comment? No, no, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, back to Colleen and a closing prayer. Before, and nous allons revenir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Closing prayer. Et nous allons revenir à, à, à Colleen et uh, à Madame Colleen, pardon. Mm -hmm. Et uh, nous aurons une prière de clôture. Thank you, Dina. Before we close, I want to express my heartfelt appreciation to Bill Reinhold and to Jose Jones. They take these wonderful presentations from our speakers and weave them together into the program you've enjoyed today. Um, they and uh, Kelly Nurell, who does the promotion, and Janet and Jonathan Cameron, who host it, are the ones who make this possible. And we're very grateful to them. Okay, d'abord, uh, j'aimerais remercier uh, deux personnes, uh, commencer par remercier deux personnes, Bill Reinhold et uh, Joe, jo Jose, Jose Jones, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jose Jones, uh, de, uh, pour uh, leur effort de vraiment tisser toutes ces présentations. Ils prennent uh, tous les fichiers, les vidéos des orateurs et arrivent à les mettre ensemble. Et puis, j'aimerais remercier aussi Madame Kelly, qui est la promotrice de, euh, de ce projet. Et puis aussi euh, le couple Cameron, euh, donc euh, euh, Janet et Jonathan. Thank you, Dina. And thank you very much for being on the hot seat through all of these um, presentations and doing such an excellent job in translation. Et merci aussi à notre interprète euh, pour euh, <rire> d'être sur, euh, sur le, le, le spotlight, euh, d'être présente à toutes ces présentations et de nous aider avec euh, euh, l'interprétariat. Thank you. And now, let us pray. Prions. Most loving God, as we come to the close of this program, we give thanks for the evidence of your spirit at work among those whose stories have been presented. Dieu de gloire, uh, en allant vers la clôture de ce programme, nous te disons merci pour les, les esprits de tout le monde. We pray that you will continue to lead your people in seeking justice, unity, and reconciliation for mm -hmm. and amongst all people. Nous prions que tu vas continuer à mener ton peuple à la recherche de la justice, de l'unité et la réconciliation pour ton peuple. We lift up your faithful servant, Etienne Bodicek, whose passing we mourn today. Nous élevons ton serviteur, Papa Tchèque, uh, que nous pleurons aujourd'hui. We pray your comfort with his family and with those for whom his witness has been an inspiration. Nous prions, pour, nous prions que tu, confort, uh, que tu apportes un confort à sa famille et aussi à tous les gens qui l'a inspiré. We also lift up the grandson of Medikanda, who was taken from his family far too early. Nous prions aussi pour uh, la famille, le petit-fils de Papa Mehdi, que, qui, est, qui nous a précédé dans la gloire, qui est parti avant. Be with us now, that for your sake and by your calling, we might continue to get into good trouble in order to bring peace and justice throughout your creation. Sois avec nous et que nous continuions à répondre à cet appel de continuer à emmener la paix et la justice dans ce monde affligé et troublé. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Au nom de Jésus, nous avons prié. Amen.
Okay, we thank you again uh, for being part of this presentation today. Nous vous remercions d'avoir fait partie à la présentation, à cette présentation aujourd'hui. And now Janet will let you all speak so that uh, you may greet your brothers and sisters. Et maintenant nous allons ouvrir le micro à tout le monde pour que vous saluiez vos frères et sœurs. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. <coughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you thank everyone. You. Thank you all. This opportunity. Thank you. Have a have a happy weekend. You too. Thank you, everyone. The same, the same to you. you. This is a great uh, collection of presentations. I learned a lot. It was. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Mimi, is 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 the uh, the warehouse is at Munkamba? Apparently, I see the lake behind the picture. Where where on the lake is it? Is it near the Presbyterian historical area? Où se trouve le dépôt exactement? J'ai remarqué qu'il y a le lac sur la sur la photo. Okay. Où se trouve? Où est-ce qu'il se trouve exactement? Pardon? From, on the shore, on the shore of Lake Munkama. Yeah, yeah. I wondered where around the lake. <laughs> Okay, parce que je me demandais exactement où, mais c'est au bord. Uh, yeah. 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 Are there any are there any particular governmental actions that are being taken or that are on the verge of needing support uh, that the advocacy work in the U.S. could help? the Congolese support or? Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des actions gouvernementales uh, uh, que les gens ou le groupe de plaidoyer ici aux États-Unis peuvent aider à supporter? Oui, nous avons des actions qu'il faut supporter uh, actuellement pour accéder à la terre. Donc, il y a des plaidoyers. So Et nous avons aussi to own or to have access to the land, we have to have uh, advocacy. Nous avons aussi le problème des droits humains. La restauration à l'équipe de gens qui les gens connaissent aussi des droits. Okay, and we also have human rights uh, issues. We need people to know their, their rights. Et les femmes, Et les femmes euh, chez nous ici ne sont pas enregistrées dans les mariages et... Euh, légalement connu. C'est un droit que les femmes aussi doivent être sensibilisées et les hommes pour que les femmes soient légalisées officiellement pour avoir les actes de mariage connus par l'État. C'est encore important. And uh, it looks like women are not officially registered in the marriage certificate. Um, so therefore, they don't really know their rights. So we need women to become registered uh, legally in the marriage certificate. Même les droits des enfants sont aussi bafoués. Il faut aussi sensibiliser les parents et l'État pour que les droits des enfants soient aussi légalement connus. We also need uh, children's rights because uh, it, it's pretty much overlooked. Uh, so we need a, a, campaign, a campaign of mo uh, um, mobilization to be able uh, to have them know and access to rights. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thanks, everyone. We will see you again in one week, same time, same day. <laughs> same day. Bye. 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 Thank you. Je suis sauvé.